So like Honor mentioned, my name is Madison, and I'm from Lit World. And today I'm going to tell you the story of three different girls. Um, but like most people, I'm really comfortable talking about myself, so I'm going to start with me. This is me. Um, I was born on April 11th, 1989 in Rolling Hills, Pennsylvania, which is a little town outside of Philadelphia. And in the hospital room was my mom, of course, and my grandparents and two aunts and two uncles. Noticeably absent from the experience was my father. Uh, my 22-year-old mother had dropped out of art school three years in when the money ran out and there hadn't been a lot of support for that dream anyway. And so she got a job waitressing to try and get herself back on her feet and that's where she met my dad. He sat at her table and asked her out on a date and when she turned him down, he just returned the next day pretending that they were on a date. Uh, the marriage lasted a little under a year because there were different priorities and they were really young and when my mom was kicked out of the house she had been working two full-time jobs and she had all of her belongings in two trash bags. Um, so when I was born I didn't cry and my mom always thought that that was because she cried so much when she was pregnant with me that I came out knowing that I had to cheer her up and my grandmother said to her when I when they announced I was a girl finally you did something right. So. <laughs> We were there, my mom, a homeless, unemployed, uneducated 22-year-old, and her baby. The next girl's name is Deja, and Deja is a 15-year-old, and she lives at the Polo Grounds, which, if you've heard of it, it's probably for a bad reason. Um, the Polo Grounds is a large, affordable housing facility on 155th Street and 8th Avenue in Manhattan. It's smashed right between the cliffs that Washington Heights is up on and the East River, and it's Five huge towers, uh, 4,600 families live in this one little neighborhood. And they say if you live on the top tower that you can watch the Yankee game live across the river. Um, and this four square blocks has the highest juvenile arrest rate in the whole five boroughs. And Deja has lived there her entire life with the exception of a short period when she was eight. Deja lived at the apartment with her grandmother, which is a common occurrence at the polo grounds. A lot of kids live not with mom and dad. Um, but mom showed up one day and said to Deja and her brothers that they had to pack their bags and they were leaving. And then dad showed up and he was banging on the door and he wanted to be let in and mom wouldn't let him in and the kids carried their bags down to the subway, which is like a plane for a little kid that's never left the few blocks around their house. Um, they were crying and they took the one hour train ride out to Brooklyn. And it was a year before Deja knew that she was living in a shelter for domestically abused women. Deja also shared the stories of having fun with her mom, playing with her in the yard on Sundays, and they had so much fun that they didn't realize that mom was in jail. Uh, and mom's in jail now, but Deja's not sure why. And the last story is of a little girl in Liberia, and I don't know her name. The Lit World team met her when they were in Liberia doing work training teachers on how to create safe spaces for learning. And as all the adults were inside singing, they heard a bunch of kids outside singing and looked outside and this little girl was leading all of the children in song. And when they passed out the post-its, she was so excited and she made sure everybody got one. And she was really eager to learn even though she wasn't in the school. And there's a lot of ways to look at these three stories. A homeless mother and a baby and a girl living in the projects and a girl in war-torn Africa. And those are all things that we people with answers feel the need to fix. Um, but that's not the best way to look at children because children aren't empty vessels that are waiting for us to pour in our experience or our opinions or our knowledge of the world. Children are little balls of nerve endings and potential. The sculptor Brancusi, he sculpts these birds and that might not look like a bird to you but it's supposed to be a bird. Um, and when our founder at Lit World, Pam Allen, went to the museum on the plaque next to it, it said somebody asked Brancusi, how does he sculpt these birds? Um, and he said that he doesn't see a bird. He just looks in the statue and he sees a bird in there. He's not thinking of a real bird, but it's his job to chip away at the marble and let the bird out. And that's the way that we need to be thinking about children, because we could say to kids, you know, read this book and eat these vegetables and play outside and don't hang out with kids whose pants are too low and then maybe you'll be okay. And that's all probably great advice and really well intentioned. But we don't need to give the bird to children. We need to chip away and find the bird inside of them. And that's what reading does. Reading unlocks the potential that's already inside of kids. And 
and being literate, being able to read, write, speak, and listen. And when I think of reading, I think of reading The Hobbit with my mom when I was three and four, and her telling me these stories and me asking these questions like, why is Gollum so sad, and what's a ring wraith, and why do elves have this color hair? And in those moments, it didn't matter that sometimes I ate cereal with water and other kids ate cereal with milk, and it didn't matter that I gave my mom Mother's Day and Father's Day presents. The same thing goes for Deja. Um, Deja is a voracious reader, and she was telling me the other day that before her AP test on Monday, she's going to read Things Fall Apart and Macbeth and three or four other titles, and she was making fun of James Patterson because his chapters are too short and she thinks it's silly. Um, and she absolutely inhales young adult literature, the stories of the boys and the girls and the conflict in the high school. And it would be easy to say to her that you shouldn't read that stuff. You're smarter. You can read these more complex books. You don't need to be reading these silly stories. But in those moments where she's loving that text, she can you know, have a friend that she's never met. She can walk straight out of the projects and to anywhere else in the world. She could be on a beach in California, or she can be in Europe, and she doesn't have to be in her own reality. And all of us are hungry for companionship, but I think we often underestimate the fact that children are so eager and so hungry to be loved and be listened to. And it's the listeners that matter, because the great inequality is not or the great injustice is not that there's an equality of outcome. That's hard to control. It's hard to say that we're all going to have a really nice house and a nice car and food to eat. The real injustice is that there's not an equality of opportunity. It's the fact that if a child has three books in their home when they're growing up, they're more likely to stay in school two or three years longer than someone without those books. But a lot of families can't afford any books to have in the home. And that if you talk to your child 10 minutes a day for a year, They'll learn 300,000 new vocab words, but a lot of parents don't have 10 minutes to talk to their children, and a lot of children don't have parents to talk to for 10 minutes. So if we're going to advocate for children, it shouldn't be necessarily just about academic success. It needs to be about agency and autonomy and the right for a child to feel loved and feel listened to. Because if you look back on your life, you can probably think of someone that made a big difference, and they weren't the cool kid that didn't talk to you and maybe pushed you into a locker. And it wasn't the teacher that didn't know your name and didn't call on you. It was somebody who maybe even for just a minute listened to you and made you feel like you were important and made you feel like your opinions really mattered. But just for every person that came into our lives in that way, there's also going to be someone that we wish we would have listened to more, but we missed the chance. or We don't have the opportunity to talk to them now. Uh, last week at the Polo Grounds, which is where Deja lives and it's where I work every day after school with a group of middle schoolers, uh, there was a shooting and a 13-year-old girl was killed in her apartment by her 28-year-old brother. And there was a really large portion of the morning when I didn't know if it was one of my kids that I work with every day that had been killed. And I was just sitting at my desk thinking, I really hope that these kids know how much I love them. I hope that they know that I'm really proud, and I hope I listened to all the things they wanted to tell me, and I hope that they feel like I care. And I want them to come home every day after school. I don't want them to go to the park. I don't want them to get in a fight. I want them to show up at after school. But I can't control that. The only thing I can really control is that I can love them, and I can listen to them. And that's where social change really happens. It's in the listening. Because the real tragedy is the stories that go untold. And unlike myself and unlike Deja, that's the story of the girl in Liberia because she fell through the cracks. Because when we went back to look for her, we couldn't find her. And that's why we don't know her name. Because nobody knew what became of her family. Nobody knew in this violent country where kids don't have the same opportunities that even our children that live in the projects have Nobody knew where she went. And so we're not going to know what she would have told us. And we're not going to know what she would have written on her post-it. And if I could wish for one thing for all of us, it would be that we really understand the power that we have in our story, the power that our story has for other people, but also the power that we have when we can listen to each other, when we take that time. Because we can change the world through listening. If we know someone's name and we know their story, then we're so much less likely 
to hurt them. We're so much more likely to care about them. We're so much more likely to hear what they need and give that to them. And it's the same thing for kids. If we let kids escape into our stories, escape into books, and to share their stories, that's when we begin to chip away at that stone around them and find the bird that's inside of them and unlock that potential. So I hope that we can prevent another tragedy of a child's story going unheard because I think we can all think of someone that we haven't listened to that we can go and listen to today. So let's change the world by listening. Thank you.